Okay, I'm going to take something of a broader approach um, uh, that has been taken up to now going beyond vaccines. First part of my talk is just reinforcing what you've already heard about making causal inferences. Latter part of my talk going beyond uh, vaccine issues to general therapy issues and ending off with some recommendations about uh, differentiating good science from bad science. Um, so, is an exposure to vaccines harmful? Association versus cause, a need for control groups, establishing benefits of treatment, and then need to look at the highest quality of evidence and guides for differentiating good from bad science. So, first of all, is hospitalization dangerous? Um, a thousand people hospitalized for three months, 40 died during this period. A thousand people in the community followed for three months, two died. Dying is 20 times more likely in hospital. Therefore, hospitals kill and should be avoided at all costs. Right? Obvious? 40 times the death rate? No? No? Okay. So we think this is amusing. Right? But there are other people who make associations that are just as spurious, but they are not as obvious. And they obviously have to do with people who are hospitalized are fundamentally different from people who are not hospitalized. So this is an example that we get amused by, but there are lots of situations when there are differences between people who are exposed to something, like a vaccine or something else, and those who aren't. Okay. Do large flat TV screens cause heart attacks? In Canada and the US, 10% of homes have large flat TV screens, maybe more nowadays. In Cameroon, less than 1%, half a percent of homes have large flat TV screens. 20 times as many large flat TV screens in Canada and the United States, and also the same 20 times the incidence of heart attacks. Clearly, large flat TV screens cause heart attacks, yes? Okay. Once again, seems amusing, but people can make associations. An increase in one parallels increase in another. It does not establish a causal connection. And again, an obvious example, there are other times where it may not be so obvious. Do vaccines cause autism? Autism is typically diagnosed in the first three years of life. 99.5% of children diagnosed with autism have had a vaccination in the last year. Conclusion. Vaccination causes autism. Is this as obviously amusing? Is this is obviously as amusing as the others? Anybody want to say uh, why, 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 why is that a spurious inference? Anybody have it intuitively occur to them why that is a spurious influence, inference? Okay, maybe a little more tricky. Okay, so a hundred mothers of autistic children report their first symptoms occurred within two weeks of the MMR, uh, MMR vaccine. Vaccine causes autism. Okay. Again, this is... Um, this one harks back to what we heard about the uh, five extremely unfortunate young women who had terrible things happen to them in relation to uh, exposure uh, to a vaccine. So there's two issues. What you remember uh, uh, in terms of events that occurred prior to some awful thing happening and attribution. And a alternative explanation, no doubt the explanation to the five cases is simply chance. Bad things are going to happen in relation to certain uh, exposures that are simply by chance. So, what are the lessons from these examples? Correlation does not equal cause. There was a correlation between hospitals and deaths. It does not mean it's causal. There was a correlation between TV screens and heart attacks. It was not causal. The other examples illustrate the need for, for appropriate control populations. You know, remember, 99.5% of those who develop autism have been exposed to the vaccine recently. But it may well be that 99.5% of those who do not develop autism happen to have been exposed. 
So some of the time people present simply two cells in the two by two table. We need all cells, the affected and unaffected, before we can make inferences about association. And then inferences about the association may not warrant, may not be causal. So there is everything I've set up to now bears some relation to the vaccine issues, but I also wanted to take it broader because we can also make inappropriate inferences that are going on all the time about treatment effects. So arthroscopy is a procedure uh, where um, uh, the surgeon puts a scope, uh, a device into the knee and does some sort of surgical procedure. Knee pain is a terrible problem for patients with osteoarthritis, and the thought has been that putting this arthroscope into the knee and doing lavage and washing it out or debriding, which means taking out painful debris, is going to make people feel better. Numerous studies report pain relief after lavage and debridement. Their people are in pain. They undergo the procedure. They say, much better. Thank you, doctor. 650,000 procedures each year in the U.S. at 5,000 bucks a crack. So here's just uh, what happens in the OR. Well, they decided to do a randomized trial by, the, by a uh, method equivalent to a coin flip. People either got the, the debridement and uh, lavage or they didn't. But they did something particularly interesting with this. Osteoarthritis patients under 75, at least moderate pain, the sort of people who undergo the procedure. Randomized to lavage, debridement, or placebo, and what had the lavage and debridement received general anesthesia. The placebo got an IV tranquilizer and some opioid. Um, <laughs> The, it was, went to the operating room, a screen separated the patient's head from the patient's knee. Um, the, they, the surgeon made an incision in the skin, asked for instruments, the nurse, please give me the instrument. Uh, manipulated the knee back and forth, saline was splashed to simulate the lavage, and the patient was kept in the OR to the time of debridement. Very effective placebo surgery. Here is what happened over time in terms of the pain. Let me see if I can, now well, I'm not sure I can figure out how to point this. Whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. Top one. Top one, I'm trying. Yes, success. Okay, these are lines, this is a pain scale, and this is what happened over time. And here's the debridement, here's the lavage, here's the placebo, and there's so much overlap you can't tell which is which. No effect of the uh, procedure, um, all placebo effects, 650,000 of these at 5,000 bucks a crack in the U.S. In fact, it has no effect. Okay, another story. This is about mortality with drugs called beta blockers, which slow the heart in patients who are undergoing surgery uh, that is non-cardiac. So they're having orthopedic surgery or surgery on the abdomen, all sorts of other, sorry, all sorts of other types of surgery. And here is a study that this is no difference between treatment and control. This means a, uh, a reduction of over 75% in mortality with these particular drugs, okay? So a study, this study was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is the highest status journal uh, in medicine. Big reduction, small number of patients, but a big reduction. And this led to guidelines that said by the most prestigious organizations, American Heart Association, American College of, Cardiovac Car American College of Cardiology, give beta blockers to these patients. But that was only one study. When you looked at the other studies, and particularly a very large study conducted uh, out of McMaster led by P.J. Devereux, the suggestion is in fact an increase in mortality. And we've in fact been giving out all these beta blockers. We certainly have not been uh, saving lives, and we quite possibly have been killing people. So what are the messages about differentiating good from bad science? So 
for treatments, we need blinded randomized trials, and it's true for vaccine efficacy as well. Doesn't work for vaccine rare side effects because you can't put enough people in the randomized trials. You have to resort to those observational studies, which then have the potential problems of the inferences like hospitalization and the inferences about the flat TV screens. Okay? Conflict of interest is a big problem in uh, uh, medical research and in the reporting. So, for instance, the individual who did this, the study, um, which was eventually proved to uh, 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 be fraud, uh, received over $400,000 uh, from the, um, uh, as a vaccine uh, autism, uh, uh, by the, from the autism uh, societies about his uh, um, claims. Okay, so lot, big financial conflict of interest. And there is also a lot of non-financial conflict of interest. And you have a lot of people, and this is certainly true, I think, of the vaccine in other areas, it's a, throughout medicine, you have people who are evangelists. They have a position that they have taken, and it's their life's mission to get this out. Um, uh, and all of us, I think, as authors, uh, uh, we love the results of our own studies and are uh, very liable to overplay those results. Who, even though these are the people that the media immediately go to, who do you not want to believe the results of a study? The people you don't want to believe is the authors of the study. They are, in. I would say, as a person who's been author of a lot of studies, um, we are invariably conflicted. We, we love our results. We want to get our message out there. We're not actually the people to listen to. Wait for somebody else who is detached and objective to comment, not the authors. Um, and replication is crucial. The, so the beta blocker story, one little study shows a big effect. Everybody gets very excited. Studies need replication. You don't want to believe the first results, particularly if they're exciting. Okay? <laughs> particularly exciting, you don't want to believe them. And we have something called systematic reviews that systematically look at the entire literature. When somebody's focusing on an individual study, you need to say, are there other studies? And has somebody put the evidence together systematically? So the message is general skepticism. Uh, when there's only the interpretation from the author, high level of skepticism. When there's no one, no, they don't tell you about the author's conflict of interest, both financial and intellectual high level of skepticism. When there is no replication or systematic summaries of all the available evidence, they just tell you about one study, uh, uh, then another reason for high level of skepticism. So I've tried to take it beyond vaccines to more general issues of good science and bad science and need for skepticism, and happy to take any questions or comments that anyone has.